Welcome to the Titans of Industry Show. I'm here with one of my favorite bloggers in the sector, Mr. Luis Comerasano of Small Gold. That's S M A U L G L D dot com. Love this guy. Such a smart dude with outside the box thinking, and I'm glad um, to have him back uh, and t to poke his brain again. I mean, how are you, man? I'm doing great, Leo. How are you doing, Luis? I'm, I'm very glad to have you here back. Um, look, I prepared some some very uh, astute questions for you because I love your commentary and I'd like to ask you one uh, one particular thing to get to get started with one of the most respected and accurate investors that I know um, believes like I do by the way that stocks in general uh, but most specifically the neck S&P 500 New York Stock Exchange stocks are insanely expensive but they're not topping off yet um, I think we got like three to four quarters of uh, going up and up and up um, where the tech sector is going to push us up more than anything. It's like the tech sector against the old economy and it's pushing up valuations like crazy. And, and then we're going to see a blow off top. Do you agree or do you think that it could happen any day now? Do you think it's years away? What is your general stance on... Uh, the broad indices in the U.S. equities. Okay, so clearly the P/E ratios, the valuations don't justify either the macro economy. They don't justify even the individual company performance. Profits are not accelerating, but the stock prices are. Uh, the reason for all this, as you know, Leo, is there is tremendous intervention in these markets by central banks, either directly through purchasing of shares, for example, the Swiss National Bank, or via interest rate manipulation, where basically cash has to go into stocks because the bonds are just not as attractive. And what I think is happening is the stock market S&P and so on are no longer, we used to think, or I used to think, that eventually market forces take over and they correct these excesses. And that's, general, that's definitely true with any market, except when you have such massive intervention by the central banks, they in a sense become guarantors of the market. Remember we had the Greenspan put well, that put has probably got so much more behind it now than it did 20 years ago. And that all started back in you know, 1987 when the stock market crashed. And unlike 1929, where then you had the stock market crash and the, and the prices didn't come back to the, the former highs until the 1950s, the stock market basically corrected in a few days. And that was part and parcel of the... Uh, President's uh, working group on, you know, on the financial financial working group where they put together the head of the the SEC, the head of the Treasury, the head of um, the Fed, and the president. And they figured out that they would provide liquidity to make sure the market stays higher, and that is an asset of the United, the United States. Has three assets: they have the um, the dollar. They have the U.S. Treasury sales, which floats the entire economy. Uh, the U.S. economy through deficit spending that's funded by issuing treasuries and people wanting the dollar. But the third is that stock market. It attracts foreign investment because it's considered a safe place to be. And uh, if it corrects, it only corrects for a short period of time. And it means that more dollar denominated assets are purchased throughout the world. And that's why the Swiss National Bank owns 1,000 some Two, no, 2,200 different U.S. equity names. And they're not just the big blue chip names. They're, any, they're companies that don't make any money. So basically, getting on the New York Stock Exchange or the S&P is almost like a guarantee that you're going to stay in business because if you don't make any profit, the um, you just do an equity offering and that keeps you running. Look at Tesla. Tesla doesn't make any money, but they can always go back to the market and, and raise capital. They couldn't do that on another stock exchange. So... I would like to think that the markets would take over, but I think they've taken over the markets and uh, normal market P /E ratios don't apply as much as they used to because there's no reason to be buying this market other than the factors that I already just mentioned. Well, interesting. And in, in, in that regard, I just wrote uh, about that, an, an article called the credit impulse and basically saying that the Fed for years have has been trigger ready. QE whenever you want, 
and, and like you said, and it goes back to the, that famous uh, Tepper uh, quote in, in 2011 where he said, uh, what? I'm going to say Fed. I don't want to go long equities. And of course, uh, the, the, the reasoning behind it is, is once the Fed goes long, you want to go long with the Fed. Wait, what are you going to do? Different? Right. Don't, don't fight the Fed is, a, is an expression. It's more true today than ever before. And so the fact that they're shrinking, their balance sheets are about to shrink it from four and a half trillion back towards the trillion, maybe the 800 million, I don't believe um, for a second that will happen, but uh, they're definitely going to shrink it and they raise rates. Is that uh, basically the end of that credit impulsiveness that fueled this guaranteed environment for people to, uh, to feel safe? Because if there's a correction, you got the Fed. If there's a correction, you got the Fed, etc. Well, I think what they're doing is they're playing for time. Remember, the rest of the world is not heading in this direction. Only recently we saw the Bank of England, I think it was today or yesterday, talk about maybe raising rates. But if you look at the Bank of Japan, ECB, Swiss National Bank, Bank of England, none of these uh, central banks are raising rates. It's just the United States. And so they're, they're raising the rates a bit, but they haven't raised them to the point where it's, it's breaking the market. And if you do have a correction and the Fed has managed to sneak a full percentage point of interest rates under its belt, well, then they can start forward guidance. They may talk about lowering rates again and then actually maybe have to pull the trigger on lowering rates. And they may say, well, we're just going to continue to roll over the, the, the balance sheet. We're not going to start um, – uh, lowering it, uh, reducing it by letting things roll off. So they're giving themselves some flexibility. And remember, I think, Lear, they, they all the central banks, I don't believe in this concept of currency wars or working against each other. I think they coordinate the entire game where it's now the United States turn to raise rates. And, and what this does, is it gives confidence in the entire fiat system, not just the United States, because then when the United States starts to lower rates, maybe then it's time for the Bank of England to start raising rates. So they all manage to stay in their band where they are the game and people are confident that this whole central banking thing works. That the United States, sure, they did four and a half trillion dollars worth of QE, but they did the prudent thing. They stopped it. They started to raise rates. They talked about you know lowering their, reducing their balance sheet more wealth to people who happen to have assets or had money to buy assets by boosting the stock prices and real estate prices. Interesting. Um, you know, that same investor says that uh, he sees the, the market going all the way up to about 50,000 points on the Dow. Is that, is that something that uh, you, you find insane or is that doable, possible um, anywhere in, in, your, uh, in your expertise? I would have found it would have been insane had the Fed in 2009 said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to print four and a half trillion dollars. Half of that's going to go towards buying from the, the too big to fail banks, all those mortgage backed securities that aren't worth much anymore. And we're going to buy just about 70, 80, 90 percent of all of the treasuries that the, the U.S. government issues. Had they said that's what they were going to do, then the dollar would have collapsed, but they didn't say that, but that's what they did over four or five years. And look what happened. The dollar is stronger now than it was when they started QE. And it's the same with the stock market. It's crazy to think from where we are now that somehow they can manipulate circumstances to push the stock higher. You wouldn't even think it would be at 20,000 today, five years ago. So I, I think it's a function that the central banks have taken control, not just of the money supply, not just of interest rates, but of financial markets. And I think they used to not have that same grip on them that they have today. As I say, it dates back to 1987, where they decided that, that was an asset, that uh, confidence in the equity markets was almost as important as confidence in the dollar. Very interesting. I'd like to switch on to uh, cryptocurrencies for, for a little bit. Do you think as a, as a whole, after, um, I know you write for Stimit and uh, you do a lot of work in the cryptocurrency space, do you think cryptocurrencies as a whole are viable yet or are they very much experimental at this point? I think that they are viable more to the extent of the amount of interest that they've captured, both from the private investor and from the central banks. 
And I was just checking, Coinbase has 8.2 million accounts. Well, that's an incredible amount in a very short period of time. So there's a lot of speculative money in the area. That's just Coinbase. I mean, there's worldwide, there's 50, 60 other pretty large exchanges. And I think what's viable about the cryptocurrencies are that people are willing to give them a chance. And by the more broad ownership now, I think it's 100 well, what is the the value of um, of Bitcoin? Is forty billion Ethereum like thirty billion? I think overall it's like a hundred billion, which is much larger than you know the annual silver mining production is less than twenty billion. So the amount of investment that's gone into cryptocurrencies may be ahead of itself in terms of what they're worth, and we can't even tell what they're worth. Exactly. And that's why I think it will continue because unlike the dot com, you could have foreseen a day, even during the craze, that these companies would run out of money. That's not the case with the cryptocurrencies. The more people are interested in them, maybe the higher the price goes, but they don't have to worry about a, a default. They don't have to worry about running out of money. They have to worry about running out of people that are interested in using them. And so far, that's not happening at all. The adoption rates are increasing, and the investment rates are increasing. Now, wait a minute. Regarding usage, let's go back to this. So Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, Litecoin, Ethereum Classic, NEM, mm-hmm. Dash, and IOTA are the eight cryptocurrencies above $1 billion worth of market cap. Uh, as far as I know, only Bitcoin is really used for what it was meant to do. And even then, yeah. Um, and so, do, do you? Th- that's why I'm asking you: Are they viable yet, or experimental at this point? Because are people using them for what they were meant to be used, or are people parking money there, hoping that this is the next lottery ticket, and just waiting it out? And you know what? I'm I, I, I've theorized that since it's it's a it's a hassle to mm-hmm. convert your money into cryptocurrencies. It's probably out of laziness that most people leave them there if there aren't, um, you know, if... Uh... It's, it's hard to sell Bitcoin. And a lot of times when you go to sell on Coinbase, it's closed. But one of the things I mentioned three or four years ago, the Bitcoin fanatics were always saying the adoption rate, everyone's going to have Bitcoin. And I kept saying, why? Why would the man in the street want to have Bitcoin to use when... Dollars work fine. Credit cards work fine. And then they started saying, well, it's speed and the transaction costs are, diff- are lower. Well, that's no longer true. We've seen the whole Bitcoin system freeze up. What's happened with Bitcoin is while it was designed to be a currency and it can function as a currency, it's probably not one of the better currencies. People are buying it now as a store of value, as odd as that may sound, because Litecoin outperforms Bitcoin in terms of speed and um and transaction costs, and there's other coins out there that are better for, yeah, for, exactly, Zcash. For, for, there, there are coins out there that work better than Bitcoin. The reason Bitcoin is, is the most uh, expensive coin is not because it performs the best. It's because it has the largest network. It has the most developers on it, and it's perceived as a store of value. You know, it's funny. The dollar, the more they create of them, in a sense, the more users, the more people that are with the dollar, the more people have incentives to use the dollar. In a perverse way, that gives it value. Everyone says, well, there's so, there's so many dollars out there. They're becoming worthless. Actually, no, that makes them worth more in, a, in an odd way because if everyone has dollars and everybody wants dollars, you can keep flooding the system with dollars because everyone's working for dollars. And it Correct. Correct. And and that's what it is with Bitcoin. And you may see a paradigm shift away from Bitcoin into Litecoin or some of these altcoins or maybe no coins. Like you say, maybe the, the governments mandate their own blockchain currencies. And then what they say is, well, then, you know, that's like outlawing something. And we know that never works when the government outlaws drugs, when the government outlaws uh, alcohol. It, it doesn't work. People, you know, want it. And and my response to that is, I think most people are not willing to become criminals just to use Bitcoin, whereas they might be willing to become criminals to use uh, alcohol or drugs because there's a need, there's a desire, there's an addiction for those things. If you can get along without Bitcoin, 
why go illegal on it? I don't see where they think somehow you're going to go underground. And if they tell the, the stores you can't take Bitcoin, do you think Walmart's going to run a side business accepting Bitcoin? You know, so I, I don't really I think the the Bitcoin people have this concept that Bitcoin is unstoppable. And there's many things that can stop it. Forget that they say the government can't control it. Well, of course they can. They can't control it to the point where if you want to do something with it, you know, you can get away with doing something. But they can shut down the exchanges. They can tell companies heavily tax it. They can tell companies not to ex to accept it. And then also there's hardware issues, uh, software issues. I mean, right now, Bitcoin may you know, have to do a fork in August. We don't know how that's all going to turn out. We don't know if people will switch to other coins. So no, no, no asset, no company is unstoppable. I, I think that's the Titanic mentality. A lot of people think that, you know, Bitcoin's there. It's got network effects. You know, well, IBM used to be king of the hill, right? Netscape used to be king. A lot of things used to be king of the hill. I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay Bitcoin. But what I'm trying to say is that there are innovations that can happen and there are, uh, faults in the innovations at, at Bitcoin, and there's also um, government could try to, to slow it down. And they can. They may not be able to stop it, but I don't think there's an incentive to continue in the same way there is when people would continue to get dr illegal drugs, illegal guns, illegal uh, whatever it is, contraband. Bitcoin, to me, doesn't hold that allure that I think people are willing to break laws to use it other than probably people who need to use it to break laws. In other words, they have a, they have an illegal business, so they're going to use bit. Of course, of course, that's that's interesting. And and you know what? To follow up on that, I'd like to ask you. You know, can you kind of define the value of Bitcoin when you when you buy a Bitcoin? And I've asked this many of of my guests. Mm -hmm. What do you own? You own the keys. You own the keys to digits. That then you could say that you can now direct where that goes, and you own the value of, of what those keys unlock. Well, I basically defined it as you own one twenty-one millionth of a company called Bitcoin that doesn't have a centralized management team. It's basically a, it's it's a, it's a company. It's it it has a utility, and it, you basically own one share of it. What you can do with that share of it is use that actual share to transact, which is kind of funny. Right. So when you when you use that when you when you look at it that way, you're basically saying you're you're paying it a premium just to transact when you could transact on another platform with a token cost a lot less. And the other thing is is that in a even in these Ethereum ICOs you actually own more in th those tokens that I've been able to get into all the different types that they have, but they're somewhat more related to equity. And then you can get in trouble with that because you're doing a, an offering that it's, you're offering equity, but Bitcoin, you don't really own 120, 121 millionth of anything. When you own a Bitcoin, you own just one of the tokens of 21 million. Now that also gives it value though, because, if people perceive the value in Bitcoin, you have one of only, when you look at it that way, only 21 million of Bitcoins. And so people that like to look at the relative scarcity of something, which I always argue is not, a def is not necessarily a definitive way of valuing anything because, you know, the, the gold-silver ratios. <laughs> if you and I own the only two... Uh pieces of hair from the uh, dinosaur period it doesn't, it doesn't give them uh... right and, and if I have created six portrait paintings and Picasso has created 3800 well mine is rare my art is rarer than Picasso's but that doesn't mean anything and also you know Litecoin has 54 million now let's say Litecoin be develops a bigger a larger um, network faster it's better um should litecoin trade at a discount because it has more coins well if the bitcoins aren't worth as much as the like i'm not saying that it's, it's the case now but if that were the case then the relative scarcity of bitcoin shouldn't be valued higher just because of relative scarcity the other one i like to use is platinum gold platinum is far rarer than gold and it's cheaper there's always a reason other than relative scarcity so what is that reason, Luis, in your opinion? Why is Bitcoin um, worth 
as much as it's worth. It's the same reason Ethereum is worth as much as it's worth. They happen to be the two largest, and it's almost like the snowball effect and the boulder going down the hill. People aren't looking at them and comparing them side by side and doing a, uh, an analysis. Because if you do do a Litecoin Bitcoin analysis, if you do the Bitcoin Litecoin ratio, the price is 58 to 1. The relative rarity is only 4 to 1. So people, because people don't know what Litecoin is, Litecoin is less accepted. But to your point, a company accepting Bitcoin or Litecoin doesn't really make it that much more valuable. In fact, I would argue the more places that a cryptocurrency is accepted, the less value it has because it means the more places you can potentially sell it. Whereas if, if it's locked into a place, we, a, a coin that's not accepted anywhere, people hoard it as a store of value, which are people are doing anyway now with Bitcoin. The higher the price goes, the less likely people are to part with. In fact, on my website, I used to get Bitcoin donations a couple of months, but ever since the price skyrocketed, no one sends it anymore. They use, they, they use PayPal. Interesting. Oh, okay. Well, that plays right into what you said. That's interesting. Um, I'd like to, to, to share with you some uh, Google Trends and tell me what they mean to you. So the search interest in the term Bitcoin trading reached a new all-time high this month. It's now 2.14 uh, times, so basically double, higher than gold trading and almost 2.3 times higher than oil trading and six times higher than silver trading. And going back to 2011, when gold trading reached a record high, gold peaked at 1925 per ounce, dollars per ounce. When the search interest for oil trading reached a record high in July of, of uh, 2008, crude fell from 147, um, and we know it fell to, towards the 30. Oil trading in April 2011 reached a record high it peaked at 50 bucks or went all the way back to 13. Now, Google mining, I'm sorry, Bitcoin mining is now 4.8 times, so 480% higher on Google Trends than uh, gold mining. And when that happens, uh, the last time it, it happened, that ratio reaching that high, Bitcoin peaked at about 1120 and crashed 74% to 293. Um, mm -hmm. Are we seeing a peak interest in cryptocurrencies, at least for the short term? I would say definitely because the price rise in Bitcoin and Ethereum attracts search interest. So the two are kind of correlated. And the question I have with both Ethereum and Bitcoin, when you do bubble analysis and when these things are going to collapse are... I think bubbles today last longer and get bigger before they burst. Um, in the dot-com bubble lasted four years. I mean, 96, 97, 98, 99, when everybody knew it was a bubble, a real estate bubble too. The only thing that popped the real estate bubble was an event. You know, they just raised the rates and boom, then it became untenable and people couldn't pay their mortgage. The difference between real estate and uh, dot-com and cryptocurrencies is there comes a point where real estate becomes too expensive because you can't afford it. But there's no such price on Bitcoin or a dot-com stock that you can't afford the, the price. You may not get, you know, when Bitcoin goes to 10,000, you're going to get a very small amount for a few hundred dollars, but you can still buy it. And when people see it's 10,000 and they figure they've left out, they missed out, it goes to 11,000. But when a home price goes to 800,000 to 900,000 to a million you start to price people out who just, no matter what loan you give them, they can't buy it. So the bubble bursts. But, you know, the, the thing with these cryptos is they can continue to go higher because you don't even have the, the, the ceiling on them that, well, hey, they don't make any money. Well, they're not supposed to make any money. And if more people want them, then they go higher. That's the, that's the real danger there is you, you when these people, they sound like idiots, well, Bitcoin to a million. Well, if Coinbase has 8.1 million users and, you know, all of them decide and it rises to 40, 50 million and they all decide they need a Bitcoin, well, you know, now that's a big demand. There's only 21 million Bitcoins to be had. Interesting. You know, um, just as a side note, uh, Bitcoin wallet surpassed Google wallet and Leather wallet on Google search interest. 
an initial coin offering, what we call ICOs, is now mm -hmm. 270%, so 2.7 times higher than IPO, than the initial public offering. I find that kind of staggering. Um, now, I want to move on uh, just uh, uh, to another uh, topic real quick. China, Russia, gold. What's mm -hmm. the big picture uh, for this? What do you see uh, when you do your analysis? Because I know you, you, you track that a lot. Um, the amount of uh, gold and, and uh, um, bullion that the, the Chinese and the Russian uh, the Russians are buying, as compared to how much uh, treasuries they're uh, they're buying at the auctions. Um, last I've checked, six percent of the world's currency supply is now backed by gold. That's a very very low uh, historically. Um, it's it's close to its all time low. That's it's very mm -hmm. um, very unique times for uh for us to be living at and what do you think of of uh what's going on with gold russia and china uh and the way they're trying to play the the big picture game here well, let's do russia first so on small gold i monthly track the gold reserves the additions or subtractions to the uh, Russian, the central bank of the Russian Federation, and then I also track the People's Bank of China's uh, gold reserves. Now, Russia has been and has been for the last three years the number one central bank gold uh, acquirer. They added about 200 tons in 2015, 200, 199 tons in 2016, and this year they're on about that same pace. So what Russia does is Russia is the second or third largest gold producing nation. They basically take about 75% or 80% of their domestic mining production. They swap those rubles for the gold, and then they add it to reserves. And gold reserves in Russia, uh, at the Central Bank of Russia, are about 17% of overall reserves. They've got about 400 billion in reserves. And they also have over 100 billion in US Treasury. So what Russia's been doing is slowly building back its reserves that it had to kind of spend over a year and a half, two years ago, when there were sanctions to defend the ruble. But the last uh, year or so, they've increased the reserves. And they've done that by increasing not only the gold reserves, but they're building back the U.S. treasuries, which they had sold off uh, for a while. And now they're, they're back to adding treasuries. Now, China is a different story because people talk about China at whatever the People's Bank of China does as China. And it's, it's kind of disconcerting because the People's Bank of China has not added any gold to her reserves since October of 2016. And the immediate response is there because they've been conditioned. They've heard, they're lying. They're, they, they're, of course, they're adding gold. And, and the idea is that, no, they're not. I don't think that the People's Bank of China is lying. There's plenty of gold going into China. There's plenty of gold that's in China. China mines the number one amount of gold it doesn't necessarily end up at the People's Bank of China. It ends up at other entities in China. The Shanghai Gold Exchange has had very robust uh, gold withdrawals over the last three years. In fact, equal to the almost equal to the annual global mining production. So demand for gold in China is very robust, but the People's Bank of China, which is the central bank of China, has lost a trillion in reserves. Now, it's, it's remarkable that they lost they went from $4 trillion down to under $3 trillion in reserves. And for a while, they were still adding small amounts of gold, but they didn't sell any of their gold during that time period. So I don't look at the People's Bank of China as a proxy for gold demand in China. I look towards the imports into Hong Kong, which have been very robust, the imports into Shanghai, which we don't know about, but then we can look at the Shanghai Gold Exchange volumes, and we know that they're very high. So China, is, and also China has arrangements with Russia, with Russian... Um, mining companies, banks, to buy gold from them as well. Now, that doesn't seem to end up on the People's Bank of China's balance sheet, but uh, clearly those two countries are big on gold. They have a lot of gold production, and most of it stays within their country or their region. Kazakhstan is the third country that adds a lot of gold to her reserves. Again, they are a gold mining country. The big gold mining country that doesn't keep gold on her balance sheet is uh, Australia. They're a big gold mining company, they're second or third, but they don't keep their gold. So the Western central banks are not adding gold. In fact, central banks in general are not adding gold other than the three I just mentioned, Kazakhstan, Russia. And uh, so 
you know, we know Switzerland sold off 60% of its gold in the two, early 2000s. England sold off a big chunk of their gold. Canada, Central Bank of Canada has no gold. Germany repatriated gold but didn't add any gold. United States hasn't added any gold since their, their numbers haven't changed since the 50s, hasn't been audited. Italy, France, those numbers haven't changed. So it's not like central banks are preparing by adding gold. All the Western banks in Europe have done is repatriated gold from the Fed and from London and from Paris, but they haven't added any gold. The only ones that are adding are the countries that actually have mining production. I remind you in that, in that respect that uh, the mining production is going down and, and we virtually have uh, very few discoveries uh, of gold in the past uh, two decades. So, so, so think, uh, think, think about this. If the central banks were to buy up that supply, they'd be doing themselves a disfavor because they'd be pushing the price of the gold higher. So that's why they lay off it. Of course. And, and obviously, the, uh, when, you, when they buy gold, they basically signal the market that uh, something's mm -hmm. wrong with their own system. Exactly. I want to, I want to ask you about uh, cyber attacks, Louis. Um, the, there, there's been a number of them, May and now in June. Um, is this going to backfire on us, on the common man? Are we going to see more government scrutiny, more surveillance? more uh you know uh, just more of of uh, what the what we don't like the nsa doing and and uh you know obviously many other agencies throughout the world that uh, that we don't know do this stuff sure i mean a cyber attack is no different than a terrorist attack in that it perpetuates a re a, a response a absolutely absolutely so yes i mean you'll have uh there's holes in the internet just like there's holes in the infrastructure the physical infrastructure and when they get exploited you know the natural reaction is and that's when the population says yeah i don't want to lose my bank account do whatever you got to do and you know that that's good that happens online as much as it happens offline interesting um lewis lastly what else is on your plate what hot, what's hot what's going on but thinking lately about demographics, and I don't necessarily subscribe totally to the idea that demographics are destiny and, you know, you're going to have um, people. I mean, one of the things that uh, people talk about is the boomers are going to sell their stocks. They're going to sell. their. Yeah. OK, uh, that that's all true. But there's there's young there's a younger world out there. It may not happen maybe in the United States. The, the people get older in Japan, they get older. But because now borders are so widespread, assets can be bought and sold across the world. So unless the world is getting older, then I think it's less of a problem other than it's a huge problem for pensions where you don't have enough people because you can't count on the rest of the world to pay for your country's pension. Although issuing treasury bonds, I guess you can, you can get away with that. But what I was thinking about in terms of demographics and why the cryptocurrencies have room to run because I think that the millennials and younger are conditioned. They don't seem to be concerned about cashless society. They seem to think that uh, those, you know, the, the cryptocurrencies have value. And I think when they get a little money, either they earn it themselves or they're they get it and re, they get it uh, as an inheritance i think they're going to look to put their money some of it into cryptocurrencies and less of it into gold and silver and i think you know until and and until until they get smacked with a big loss uh, and we don't know when that'll happen. You know, it may not happen for years. It may be that these cryptocurrencies continue to rise just because more and more money is attracted to the sector. And unless something happens to stop that flow, I, I expect them to continue to rise. Very interesting observation, Louis. Um, Louis, can you tell more? Can you tell people about uh, the website and everything you're doing in there, please? Sure. Smoggle, thanks for the opportunity. Smoggle, S-M-A-U-L-G-L-D, smoggle.com. Please subscribe there. Fill in your email address. I'll keep you up to date on what's going on in the gold, silver, real estate, economics, all the things that you're, you're interested in. Also, follow me on Twitter at Smoggle and on YouTube, the Smoggle YouTube channel. Luis Comerzano, Smoggle, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure as always. Thank you, Lior.